And this is the Adam Messer Show. I'm your host, Adam Messer. And my special guests today are the End of Watch crew uh, with Bootsy and Sal. Kevin Grogan is Bootsy and Sal is Lou Belosi, right? And then we have the executive producer of the show, Jason Ussery, who is uh, also known around town for like your screenwriting and your movies and stuff like that. So um, the first hour we were talking a lot about kind of like who y'all are and, uh, you know, what y'all do. And then during the break, we were talking about like, you know, is there anything you'd like to talk about? And you were, you brought up like talking about mental health for um, law enforcement. So let's dive into that. That's a huge theme for our show. Uh, we address it and Bootsy and I are addressing it from our own personal experiences. Uh, and we talk about it with our guests. We've even had renowned police psychologist Marla Friedman uh, on one of our episodes. And we, we take it to heart uh, because of our own personal experiences. And we like getting it out there and talking about it because Bootsy and I have both worked hand in hand with numerous law enforcement officers, police officers, federal agents uh, who've killed themselves. You know, guys we knew, guys we work with, uh, who've put a gun up to their head, you know, and, and killed themselves. And, and it's something that nobody wants to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. I know, Even I know, the agencies. In I've the had a couple of friends that committed suicide, yep. too, and it's... It's uncomfortable to talk about. People don't like to bring That's it up. Right. But uh, we feel it's important because if you don't get it out there and you don't talk about it, it's just going to keep happening. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the news <laughs> and you look at what, what's been going on lately... Uh, police suicides are on the rise, uh, and you know we like to mm -hmm. we like to get it out there, get the word out there, talk about it because that's the only way we're going to make things better. No, and, and we talked to Dr. Friedman, uh, Friedman about that. You know the statistics on it. You know they're not accurate uh, simply because you know <laughs> government agencies don't want to pay. You know the budgets are already you know cut. They're already doing that, which. Again, I think is a direct uh, reflection of the negative uh, portrayal of law enforcement in the mass media. So the budgets get cut. Those treatment, you know, isn't available for officers. And, you know, in a very male-dominated, and there's a bunch of fantastic female police officers out there too, but it's a male-dominated profession and the stigma of mental health and, and that kind of stuff. Nobody wants to hear you cry about how you don't feel good. Well, you hit it on the head, about cry about it. Yeah. That's, you know, that's like if you if you have a, some kind of concern or something like that, why are you crying? Well, and the, and the thing is. is, is Boys don't and, cry. <laughs> yeah. you know? No, and, and the thing is I, I joke about it, but it's but it's so true. That's I mean, I mean but that's a great way to, to put it in a nutshell because it's like, yeah, what are you crying about? You know, and uh I mean, PTSD is a real thing. You know, they used to call it shell shock. You know, it's had a lot of different names over the years, but it's a real thing. And a lot of people, you know, honestly, I came out a month ago with a post talking about having depression. I've had depression since I was like 13, you know, and uh, some of the people that know me, I work with hand in hand, side by side every day, 40, 50 hours a week, told me they had no idea that I, I was depressed, you know, and it's... I really never wanted to bring it out and talk about it. I never wanted to do that because I was like, you know what? Um, everybody's got their problems. You know, everybody deals well, with their own things. Well, and it's not exactly a comfortable conversation to have. Well, people look at you different. They treat you differently when they, oh, you're depressed? They're like, oh, what's, you know, are you crazy? Well, you know, but, I, but I can tell you? you that's that's magnified in the law enforcement oh, community. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. It's a lot you, worse you for y'all. You can't have the perception of, well, and I'm not going to say it's worse for it. It's just it, it's... It's so magnified because, you know, you are carrying a firearm at work. That's what I'm you saying. It's worse be for y'all because you're tasked with the, the job to protect other people. You know, I'm not. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, but you, you – and you deal with – mental. I mean, we had a shooting here in Savannah the other day that was directly related to – it was a mentally, you know, ill young man who, you know, was in a tragic position and police officers responded to it, you know, and he wound up being shot and killed. Mm -hmm. And everybody has opinions about those situations, but yeah, you know, had this kid gotten treatment, couldn't have gone another way. But you can train as much as you want and go to as much, you know, be as uh, educated about mental health as possible. But when you have mentally ill folks, can kill you just as quick as uh, completely 
you know, normal is the wrong word to use, but people who are not affected, they can kill you just as quick. And the thing is you have to deal with the situation. If somebody's pointing a gun at you, mentally ill or not, you ha- you know, you don't get paid enough to not go home at the end of the day. I, I saw something, I can't remember, but there's going to be like a, a dial, like a, a 911 type number for uh, suicide prevention because there's a suicide yeah. hotline right, right. now. Um, there's is a, there there's a lot of them. Yeah, is there is there uh, some something for specifically for like veterans and law enforcement that work? Because because you know I can imagine. I mean, honestly, I I can understand, but unless unless you live that perspective, you know, you don't really. I mean, like I couldn't identify with the, some of the stuff that you're talking about on a personal level. I can understand it all day, but to really get it, Lou said it earlier. You know, you who it, it's hard to connect with folks unless you feel. Like they truly understand when he said, you know, yeah. who are you to judge me? The thing is, who are you to understand or, you know, can you truly understand if you haven't been where I've been? And that's. Yeah. Well, I like you know, how you said, have I earned that right to judge? That's mm-hmm. right. Uh, you know, that like fundamentally, that is a, a, a just a core question. You know, yeah. honestly, I'm like, wow. You know, that's one of those ones that I I learn stuff every day. But that is a that's one I'm going to keep because have I learned have I earned that right to judge somebody? If I ask myself that honestly, mm-hmm. no. Yeah. Uh, you know, ask yourself, you know, am I, am I living the lifestyle? You know, I, as far as I'm concerned, there's only one person who's ever walked this earth who lived a lifestyle that earned him, you know, the right to judge someone. And ironically, he didn't judge anyone. And, and, judge and it's right. not Bootsy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely not Bootsy. <laughs> but going back, to the, going back to the depression you're talking about and PTSD, These are not new things, okay? Depression, PTSD has existed since man has been on the earth, okay? They are not new things. However, until recently, unacceptable to talk about. Right. Okay? Yeah. An unacceptable subject to talk about. Uh, Now, I think we're at a point where it's becoming more acceptable. Mm -hmm. But in the law enforcement and military community, we're a little bit behind, Okay, because of whatever reasons you want to say that Bootsy Bootsy touched on these reasons, it's still not as acceptable, you know, if you're a soldier or if you're a cop, you know, to, you know, to call your buddy and say, man, boy, that was rough, man. Seeing those dead bodies, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that that really has affected me. I feel it's it's not acceptable. You got to roll through it and be a tough guy. And if you ask 100 people on the street, common folks that are just regular folks, have you ever seen a dead body? The only time they probably have ever seen a dead body is a funeral. Right. You know, not talking about a violent murder. Yeah. You know, and what, you know, when you're talking about that situation, you can, you can, and I have not ever seen a person murdered. Okay. I want to put that. You can watch as many horror films and blood and gut films as you want. That's not real life. Right. And people, I think they have a disconnect there with like, oh, I, you know, I could play a video game. I could shoot a gun. Well, and one yeah. of the big things in, in this day and age, you know, it, this country, we've been at war since 2001. Right. So, you know, and we've been bombarded with violence and, and on the news every day for the past, you know, 19 years. Yeah. So there's been so much of it. And, and I think a lot, and I can't believe I'm saying this because it makes me feel old, but we're also desensitized through, you know, just regular TV program and yeah. everything that's on video games and there, there's so much violence and that kind of stuff. But the the one thing that I've experienced a lot with a lot of folks is you sit and talk. Like you said, it's not an everyday thing for some people when you're outside of the law enforcement community or military community. Um, violent death is not something a lot of people deal with. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of guys and they say, well, I've never been in combat, but I know how I'm going to react. No. And the thing is, that's when you know you're talking to somebody that's not really – because it's different every time. Yeah. Every situation is different. A murder is different from a suicide. A suicide is different from a natural death. It's different from a child's death. You know, they're all, there's no way you can put a label on it and say, oh, and somebody's dead. This is how I deal with it. So you never know how that one's going to hit you. I mean, I, I've been around a lot of guys who've worked in positions for a lot of years. Mm-hmm. Right? And you would think, I can't believe this guy deals with this stuff and doesn't bat an eye at it. Yeah. In my experience, it wasn't until about 10 years after I walked away from uh, being away from it where it really started to affect 
you know, dreams and, and the way I looked at things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I don't like to hear a lot of people say, oh, well, it, that guy's soft because he can't deal with it. Eh, it. You know, that's really not the case. It's, well, you, you again, just, he, has he earned the right to say that? Yeah. I mean, Bingo. that's a great. Yeah, that's a. Bingo. You need to put that on a shirt. Like, yeah. you need to put that on a shirt. Like, yeah. yeah, that would, that's like just freaking powerful. Mm -hmm. That is, that is really powerful. But, you know, we're all human and we all do it. Yeah, we do. We all do it. But, you know, if you can if you can take a step back and say, hey, you know, let me remove myself from the situation and think about like, OK, the, this other person I'm talking with, they're a human being. You know, they might be shouting at me or yelling at me or whatever. What can I do to de-escalate de the situation? You know, I'm not, I'm not talking about like law enforcement. I'm just talking right. about regular life. Oh, right? yeah. Absolutely. You know, I mean, like. But it's all applicable. See, in law yeah. enforcement, the thing is those laws are being forced in regular life. Yeah, That's it's a, real you know, life. It's it's an everyday thing for everyday people all the time. That that's uh, really good. So, what are some of the resources here in town that people can? Well, you know, there's the suicide hotline, but the thing is, Dr. Marla Friedman. It's uh, behindthebadge.org, which is really geared towards um, law enforcement specifically. Okay, and you can log onto the website and and check it out, and they have a list of. Suicide hotlines, chat lines, and, and that kind of stuff. The uh, city of Savannah has an employee's assistant plan for the police department here. I'm not a huge proponent of that. You know, we brought that up on uh, on the podcast with the uh, you know Westfield's fellow Westfield State graduate uh, and special agent in charge uh, ATF in Los Angeles, Carlos Canino, uh, and he talks about you know because it's kind of a conflict of interest. You work for the government or the you know, be it federal, state, or whatever, mm -hmm. and that agency's assistance program is the one that's going to uh, help you. It doesn't seem to. Uh, it kind of counteracts your whole confidentiality right, thing. Right. I don't feel real safe. You know, I uh, don't mind saying. They used to like when I worked at the school. <laughs> They used to call everybody into, a, you know, like a big meeting, you know, whatever. This is a safe room. You know, tell us about the problems. Right. And then the folks that were vocal, they were the first ones to get laid off. Well, yeah. and, and let me it, tell it's you. It's kind of like the uh, anonymous surveys. Right. You know, and you rate right. your supervisors. And, yeah, next thing you know, it wasn't so it was, anonymous. It was, an, yeah. yeah. And the other thing, <laughs> this is a safe room. Well, let me tell you a little, a little anecdote about the law enforcement profession. All right. You telegram. Telephone and tell a cop, and that's how your information's getting out. You know, it's there aren't very many secrets in in the world. How and like I said, I'm I'm sure they help people. It just kind of was always a conflict of interest to me, and I, I don't mind saying. But I had a drinking problem for a long time, and I went to uh, I actually I just actually stopped drinking last July. It's yeah, been, it's been five years. Congratulations, and, and, man! Uh, that's that's yeah. a not, not at all. Believe me, it was the best, smartest thing I've ever done. No, I mean five years. That's but that's a good bit of you know time was, to be uh, sober. Yeah. Well, I've tried to, I've tried to get him back. <laughs> he's been, he's been, multiple times. He's been super supportive, <laughs> but no, yeah, I mean it, it's one of those things. But I, I did go to uh, the uh, employee assistance program, and I gotta say, it didn't help me at all. Uh, and that's not a knock on them. It was all on me. You know, right. if, if anybody's dealt with. Uh, addiction or you know alcoholism like i deal with it's it's all on me you know what i mean and the thing is you get people around you that will help you unless you're willing to take that help or or do that and then you know you're not going to get better unless you do it yourself and that, for me i just thing. got to the point where i was just sick of drinking you know and i wasn't drinking excessively oh, I, I wasn't was just, sick of it <laughs> yeah i was just tired of uh i was just tired of it you know i was like you know what let me just not do it anymore and now, there's been a couple of times where I'm like, oh, man, I really would like a, you know, like a, a rum and Coke or something like that, sure. you know, but I don't do it. Not know? drinking hasn't hurt me at all, except Lou makes fun of me a lot, but that's, you know, I, do. I, I get over that. I'm used to it. I, uh, Anthony Hopkins was talking about how uh, he likes to drink, you know, and he enjoys it. And I think it's, it's different for everybody. Some people, you know, can enjoy a, a drink or two and it's not a compulsion for them. But when it's a compulsion and you feel addicted to like, oh, man, I've got to have it. Like even talking about it to me, sometimes like, you know, I'd like to have a beer right now. Right. Honestly, I mean, I would right now I would drink a I would drink a cold beer right this minute just because we're talking about it. That's a compulsion. No, and, sure. I, and I won't go off on a tangent, but, you know, I drank for a long time. I drank seriously for a long time and it was never a problem for me. 
mm-hmm. until I told myself I couldn't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. And then, you're then like, it became wow. a problem. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, whoa. You're but that's where the motto <laughs> one day at a time comes from. I, it's, I never say I'm never going to drink again, but mm-hmm. I'm not going to drink today. You know, and you take it one day at a time. Chunk it down like, you know, uh, how do you eat an elephant? On one bite at a time, right? It, and that's exactly the same philosophy. Um, everybody, you're listening to WRUU LP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. Um, y'all were also saying that you want to talk a little bit about, um, like, another group, uh, Twilight something, or what was it called? Alien Works. Oh, yeah. No, you're talking about, you know, the the amount of – the fun thing for us, yeah. and, and I'll speak for us, but uh, for me – you know, like I said, I never planned on being a writer. Right. But Savannah, Georgia is such a creative city right now. You know, yeah. all the with all the tax incentives that have brought Hollywood to Savannah, there have been some really, really cool projects that have happened. You know, big big movies have been filmed here. Mm-hmm. It's not uncommon to see movie stars walking down Broughton Street or that. But what I found it has been the most fun for me is all these little things. So here we are on a radio show with you, Adam, and mm-hmm. you know, cause you're involved in the creative community. You do all I these. didn't even realize I was like one degree away from Lou. Yeah. From, you know. yeah as I say, <laughs> you know, it, and it's funny how yeah. we'll look at it well, in two weeks it, from you now. Know, like Jason, I, you know, it's so crazy because I didn't even know Jason knew you and vice versa, mm-hmm. right? Yep. you know? And, um, and then we were taught like you, you came out to the podcast and I was like, well, yeah, I met Kevin before at the, yeah, yeah. at the author thing. Yeah, no, so. and it's it's such a small town, and it's so close knit. Mm-hmm. But like Jason and I, like my uh, book cover was done by some folks out at uh, Tyson, or excuse me, Titan Presents. I mm-hmm. think uh, they were out on Tybee Island. Well, they've since moved on to Edgerton, Georgia. Edgerton. I think Edenton mm-hmm. uh, bought a facility out there. But some of the guys that were out on Tybee stayed here, and a guy named Jim Wacker who I have absolutely nothing nice to say about, uh, <laughs> helped me put, yeah, I mean, they did a great job on the book cover. And my, like, it's my favorite part of the book is the yeah. cover. They did such a great job. But Wacker went over, and now he works for a production company called Alien Works. Mm-hmm. And they're okay. they're out there on uh, Chatham Parkway. But they've done, what if part you've of Chatham seen, Parkway are they at? Uh, right behind the Toyota deal, almost to 16. Oh, okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. They're right yeah. down I, in that, one of the little like industrial little parks. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And, I, I, and well, Phoenix before you used get to, be to right Customs there. and Border Patrol before. Right, that yeah. same road. Yeah, I used to work right across the street. Uh, like you go down the other way, and they have those uh, buildings behind the lake. Yeah, the so did Lou. Yeah. <laughs> I worked at the University of Phoenix there. Okay, like yeah, yeah same side of the street. To 2013. Yeah. If if you go away from 16, one more turn, uh-huh. that's where Alien Works is. Oh, okay, a little bit down okay, there. yeah, but. These guys, I mean, in a lot of the films, they do all a lot of technical stuff. Like any major movie production that comes into Savannah, Alien Works is doing the yeah. digital stuff. Mm-hmm. But the drone footage, like Sylvester Stallone uh, did a film in Garden City. All the drone work for the trailer was done by these guys. I had no Alien. idea Sly was Stallone was there. Mm-hmm. Wow. What Mark was it New- Mark, Mark Wynn. Mark Wynn, yeah. Mark Wynn did the what drone was that? footage what was that on that. Oh, man, I'll have to look that up. But, yeah, they did the drone work for the trailer. But uh, the Poison Rose mm. was shot here with John Travolta and Morgan Freeman and Alien Works. I, Jim know, actually, Wacker I did. I came across that movie the other day, and I put it on my to-watch list. It's Is it good? terrible. Is it a terrible? They it's missed. Terrible swing and a miss. Yeah, it's a, a D-listed movie. Yeah, yeah, but the with the cast, you would have thought it would have been the greatest thing that ever. And a... and I read the script. The script is <laughs> phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way they were shooting it, like the way it shot, the cinematography is excellent. Mm-hmm. You know, and again, you're hearing so, so the opening scene is a night shot of the Lucas Theater, and it's like, mm-hmm. wow, right. that's really really cool. Uh, but I can't think of that. Sylvester Stallone flick. God. Hey, Bill. Look, How you either doing? way, these guys, like I said, they're consummate professionals. But I know Jim Wacker, Josh Jasso, you know, Mark Wynn, all, all these guys. And I got talking to Jason. He's like, hey, I know those guys. I love you. Like, mm-hmm. it, it's such a tight knit community. Well, it's he, like, uh, guys, hey, Bill. Bill. It's, it's just like Bill Cooper. How you doing? Uh, Bill Mr. Cooper, how are you? Uh, he is our. Guest on, um, he's our our host on Savannah at night. But Bill's done what, like what seventy something movies, Bill, that you've been in. Scared films, yeah, fifty, yeah. 
That's, he's three been a bunch major of major productions, but just small extra projects. But it's so cool because you know this town. You you know you get to know a lot, you know a lot of folks. Like Jason does um, his own movies, and this you know Lou he and Kevin have their podcast and to watch, and and Jason does his all the production stuff. And we're just talking about how small well, Savannah the, is, or everybody. Again, it's the opportunity available today with the internet, yeah, you know, with podcasts, with, yeah. with things that were not available mm-hmm. even when I started acting, which was you know sixteen years ago. It yeah, a lot of I mean, it just wasn't available. There was no podcast then. Sure. Yeah, we're just talking about how small Savannah is, and like you know, you get to know somebody, you meet somebody, and like uh, Bill had a. Uh, a comedy show the other night um down at the new starlin yard mm-hmm. and uh a great venue yeah i hadn't been to a comedy show in man forever honestly um probably 20 something years and uh i went out to build, support <laughs> bill's show and then bill's like hey man do you want to get up on stage i was like no and then and then i said well i'll get up on stage if i could tell the story of how we met <laughs> Because it's it's a funny story, but it was funny because like you know you, you see this you see a lot of the same people over and over again, and then like I said I didn't know that you two knew each other, right. and then it's like oh look well how you know how did it all work out and then yeah you, know, you seem like you know a ton of people too so it's I just think it's pretty cool. No, yeah. but in the the venue that's opening up you know like that Starlin Yard there in uh, mm-hmm. it's the Starlin dr- District I think they call it on DeSoto. I mean that place is coming up. The old Save a Lot used to be one of my stops. <laughs> Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. What what an interesting neighborhood. Yeah, I mean, that's, that place has changed yeah, a lot. No, and it, and it happened. Yeah. And what's funny about that is a friend of Lou and mine, or the, he's the guy that built it, uh, Billy McIntosh. Star on Yard? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. See, uh, small it, world. Is it JTVF construction? JTVS, yeah. Yeah, those guys. Know, uh, the Star on Yard guys were featured in South Magazine yep. recently, mm. right? Yes, they were on the cover, and it, what an interesting place, you know, because it started out it, that Starlin Yard was supposed to be the solution to the food truck problem, so you know, Give them a home. getting licensing yeah. gives them a place to go. But they built something around so the trucks can pull in. But there's a a pizza place that the, the pizza's fantastic. Oh yeah, uh, outstanding. Yeah, it really is. It's, no, really it's just is. a cool venue, you know. If they get a great bar that everything is centered around, you can play bocce. You can, I mean, well, they had, they had a comedy out. show there the other day, and like, uh, what, 16 or 17 local comics all did a, a little we set? Had, yeah, close to 15. Yeah. It was a 15? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's counting you, 16. So, uh, I wasn't, I wouldn't count, I wouldn't count me. <laughs> I wouldn't count me. So 15 and a half? <laughs> yeah, I was like, like the extra little extra. I can see it next month. Where's Adam? Where's Adam? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, Actually, I did get some laughs. I, I got a couple of laughs. I, uh, I didn't totally did. bomb. <laughs> You know, just briefly, I don't want to interrupt your show. Mm-hmm. No, I, I love I love having you in here, Bill. I mean, you're a great I, guy. Um, I want to know, introduce comedy, you to them. Anyone in here, you know, seriously, ever done stand-up comedy? Oh, no. And I'm funny, and well, I'm funny uh, as all get out. <laughs> and I'm a, I'm a funny guy, too. But yes, no, I never but why, why haven't you, briefly? Uh, no one's ever asked me. Okay, well, I'm, I'm inviting you. Okay. To give it a whirl. Let's do it. Uh, yeah. It definitely takes a lot of guts to get up in yeah. front of yeah, people. And, yeah. and, you know, the thing I learned about comedy is it's like anything. It's an art. You know, they're, they're yes. really, there's a there's yeah. a lot to it, setting things up. And, and I know guys who are naturally funny, like timing. Yeah. Lou, Lou and I can sit here and talk to you and make you laugh all day. But it, it's not. Does that translate? It's just, right. Yeah. To, to get up in front of people and perform like that. It's like writing a book. Yeah. You put it out there, you pour your heart and soul into that thing and then put it out and man, people or spend can do whatever a month they want. Writing fifty thousand yeah. words yeah. and you're like, uh oh. yeah. 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 instantly find out. As in the hard thing when I first did it, as I tell people, I, I was uh, yeah, sixty eight years old, first time I stepped up there and tried it because Takes guts, well, Melanie man. told me I could. Mm-hmm. So Melanie, if you know Melanie Goldie in town, she you know, she's into poetry and comedy and acting and that. And I was acting with her, and she said, "Oh, come on, you can do it." I said, "How do you know? I've never done it." Mm-hmm. And I get up and bombed. And I walked at my age, though. You got to remember this. I walked off the stage, not disappointed. I says, "I will figure this out." And, yeah. and there you go. You it take it as a challenge. Yeah. Me. I, yeah. And then That's the awesome. second time, I got one or two little laughs. I, and I love I the just, the other night. I love yeah. the uh, the little heart pills uh, joke. That was. So oh. <laughs> can I tell can I tell all these guys on one? Yeah, and it's a true story. Yeah. So so Bill and his where where are y'all from? Like um outside of Boston? Yeah. Massachusetts. Massachusetts. So they're gonna go on a trip, right? And uh, you know, his wife Marianne, 
and if anybody's playing the game at home, like you know, Bill's Bill's got this little drinking game at home. I was, I gave the preemptive uh, drinking game there, Bill. That's fine. But anyway, um, Marianne, like the three or four days beforehand, is saying, you know, Bill, you know, you need to get your stuff packed. You need to get your stuff packed. Bill's yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, kind of yeah. whatever. The the day they get to driving, he said, what you drive like eight hundred miles the first, the first day, day, and the yeah, second day the you do like three fifty. Three fifty. So they get. Uh, like a mile out from their destination on the second day. No, first day. On the first day. We had just left the house. They just left the house. You left the house? One mile away. You, oh, you're only a mile away. One I thought you were away. a mile away from After the destination. Her asking me for three days to uh, pack early. He goes, oh, we got to turn around. <laughs> got to get my heart pills. I, this makes it even funnier because I didn't realize it was only a mile away. And she goes, eh, you'll probably be all right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds she's like, a nurse. Sounds like every woman I've she's, ever she's dated. She's a nurse. <laughs> but, you know, I can think right. Mary Ann's thinking like, you know, what in the world? I told you for three days now to pack your stuff. And well, she's like, I, I said, look, you know, it was they were on the counter beside these. Look what I grabbed instead, the Tic Tacs. And she says, I said, so we got to turn around. We can't go three weeks without my heart pills. She says, ah, let's see what happens. Can I have a Tic Tac? <laughs> <laughs> see, I, I like that because, you know, this is, you know, just kind of going back to your point where, yeah, you, you. There's so many different people in the, in town, and you know a lot of different ways well, that you. Can... I listen. I listen to a lot of Joe Rogan, and he and <clears throat> Bill Burr talking about a good oh, Massachusetts yeah. guy. Yeah. We're sitting down, and they were talking about Bill Burr's funny setting up jokes. But like, I just think they go up there and spew. You know, yeah, they yeah. just go and talk. You know, and they kind of because everything we do is pretty much stream of consciousness. You know, it comes in my head and out my mouth. But mm-hmm. these guys, I mean, the the art of it and they they do it so well obviously i mean they're yeah. tremendously successful guys but i had no idea joe rogan was so funny joe rogan man did you ever hear about his beef with uh mencia i'm sure oh, he yeah. talks about that oh no yeah. he stole yeah. all his jokes right right and uh man joe rogan is a, a pretty tough dude i mean he's Very got a black tough. belt he's and a, a lot of people black belt great kickboxer too. right right well, well he started legit. he started in taekwondo we i actually used to go to karate tournaments with uh andre tippett the Hall of Fame linebacker for the New, New England, England Patriots. Patriots. Uh, but Joe Rogan <laughs> used to compete at those tournaments. He was a Taekwondo, and he was a beast then. Well, you know, the crazy thing about it is, like, uh, he was he had a lot of shows. He did, like, comedy, and then he had, like, what, Fear Factor and all that. Yeah. But people really know him today for his podcast, you know, the Joe uh, Rogan Show. It's a number one podcast. Right. I mean, like, if I, I think of anybody that's been really influential as far as, you know, Doing a podcast. Oh, yeah. I mean, the reason why my show is called the Adam Messer Show is because of the Joe Rogan show. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's like simple, straightforward. I just wanted to, you know, be something real, cl- you know, easy peasy. Right. Well, he's a phenomenal interviewer, and he has that that like Howard Stern like talent to get people to just and open up smart. and tell no, them. The guy yeah, is super yeah. oh, smart. Absolutely. He's I mean, he's had so many guests smart. on there. Like, you know, you would just be like, where in the world, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like high level thinking type stuff. Well, we're we're waiting for our invite. Yeah, he started out. Me too. <laughs> you know, mostly he started out interviewing MMA guys, and mm-hmm. and then he kind of branched out just the same way Bootsy and I have started out with law enforcement and military guys. Mm-hmm. And we're planning on branching out as yeah, well. We hit our Hollywood. Yeah, we're going to destroy gonna, Joe Rogan. That's our plan. There. That's mm-hmm. it. Well, yeah, we're we're coming for you, Joe. Yeah. Oh gosh. <laughs> I'm not Joe. You can interview me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't mean me in that way, Joe. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, it's so funny. Uh, those, those guys are awesome. Hey, we got to do a little station break. Uh, Sebastian, do you mind playing for us? This is Sebastian Messer, everybody. And his band's called Krieger. To the little station IDs. This portion of WRUU Savannah Sound well, Games Programming Chief. is brought to you by listeners in the 2020 Savannah Music Festival, presenting Americana artists Jason Isbell and the 400 Unit, Mandolin Orange, Balsam Range, and Third Time Out, Sarah Jarrows and Madison Cunningham, Leo Kotke, Amethyst Kia, 
Bruce Hornsby and the Noisemakers, and more. Information at savannahmusicfestival.org. You're listening to WRUULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with global soul. All right, everybody. Welcome (laughs) back. (laughs) You're listening to the Adam Messer Show, and I'm your host, Adam Messer, with our guest today from (laughs) End of Watch Podcast. And we also have uh, Bill Cooper, who is from the Savannah uh, at Night Group, and uh, he just came in. I, You know, honestly, uh, my second hour, Bill comes in at like 5, right? And so I usually be like, hey, Bill, you want to come in and talk? And yeah, so I figured it'd be kind of neat for everybody. Bill's a pretty funny guy. Yeah. yeah. I want to see this stand-up show now. Yeah, well, it's going to be, what, the 4th Thursday? The 4th Thursday of each month, that'll be, I believe, the 27th of February out at Star It's free. Yard. It's a free show. It's like, wow. you know. A few other places I do it, too, but that, that one there is cool. I mean, it, it's the first Everybody time. was super nice. Uh, there were, I mean, I'll be honest with you, there, it, it ranges, you know, because everybody's, you know, in the, whatever. There were a couple of people that just killed it. I mean, yeah. literally, that one guy, um, Jules. Jules. Oh my gosh, he was talking about like food service and being in the food service. I'm waiting for Bill to come in with the. Oh, I just flew in from Lowell. My arms are killing me. <laughs> yeah, that's a classic. That's a classic. Yeah, that's a classic. Um, so I had to fly in from it because I don't have an airport. I can't go back. To it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, Jason, I got a question for you. Yep. With um, talking about production, um, let's say somebody wants to do their own podcast mm-hmm. you know um do you have like some quick and dirty tips on you know like what to do to get started well um you know when uh, i met these two guys uh i really didn't have a whole lot of idea how to how to get started myself um okay. i'd kind of uh given it kind of a cursory glance because of some things that i wanted to develop um but um, for, for us, because we wanted to distribute um, as widely as possible, as quickly as possible, um, I, we started on the Anchor app. Um, now, our first, uh, I think, seven episodes were audio only, and then we, um, we moved into um, to video as well, mm-hmm. uh, which with my background, um, you know, fortunately, I, I have that background, so right. it was, wasn't such a leap for me to, to take that part on. Um, but, you know, uh, for us, I mean, we have, uh, when we were just audio, um, Kevin and Lee were uh, recording on a Zoom uh, recorder. Yeah, Provided by Alienworks. Alien awesome. Go. I have a, I have an H5. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're great. They're great um, uh, piece of equipment, that's for sure. So I uh, started out with that, um, and then I would take that just into Adobe Audition and do some minor cleanup and things like that, you know, uh, you know, we bought a title track for our music and things like that, and then just kind of added atmospheres and things. Um, and early on, we were just doing audio. I was doing a lot of editing out of ums and things like that. I don't do that anymore because it's a lot more difficult with video. And we're far more professional now. We don't <laughs> say um at, anywhere near as much. They're getting better at it. Uh, right. <laughs> I don't um, either. Um. Um. But uh, when we moved into video. The, 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 the clicking and the, the you know, the little... Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, uh, you know, when it's like when you close your mouth or you open, it's like yeah, you know, that sure. little pop. Yeah. Um, but when we there moved into we, exactly, <laughs> we moved into video. Um, we, we uh, I had been familiar with the Zoom, uh, the Zoom. It's like Zoom dot US. It's mm-hmm. the Zoom software, video meeting software, uh, which is okay. Okay, so you're talking about the um, like the. The face-to-face, the actual, yeah, face-to-face yeah, yeah. video yeah. Uh, cast. Service. Is that how the YouTube got started? That is, yeah. So okay. it ended up uh, being really convenient because you can set it so that it actually uh, switches between the feeds, right? So right. I don't have to go in and do individual edits. The I have done does two interviews. Like I've been on two interviews on Zoom, and it's the first time I was like, "What is this?" You know. But it's actually really good software. It is, it's and it's and it's you know pretty clean. Um, uh, the the sound quality is largely pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it depends obviously on the internet connection and what video camera is being used. But it's also relatively uh, dummy proof. I mean, if I can do it, anybody out there can do it. 
Yeah. So yeah, and so you know when when those uh, pieces are done, uh, they do the interview, send it to me. I throw <coughs> any sort of information or um, photos, like or credits anything, or whatever, yeah, up links and, and that uh, kind of stuff. Right, and then put that on YouTube. So we have the YouTube page, which is our video cast, which mm-hmm. is storefront podcast on YouTube, and then um, and then you know we can be found and watch on uh, you know Apple. Apple yeah, I did a Google podcast. search on the way in. My uh, while my son was driving, he while I was driving. My son did a search real quick, and uh, we were listening to the newest episode mm-hmm. on. Um, actually, I I just went to Anchor because I had the app, you yeah. know, and I've got the Apple Podcast. So we were listening to that, and um, it's I think it's really neat. I mean, doing the podcast myself, it's it's it, like when I first got into it, it was really you know kind of hard because I was trying to do YouTube, mm-hmm. uh, but using. Um, like anchor um or using like youtube you know those those popular platforms it's it's pretty straightforward like you said i mean like sure. software is easy to use it's easy to set up you know um, i was talking to a person last week about they were saying that they wanted to start their own podcast mm-hmm. and i was like you know what it's it's not that hard you can you can do everything you need to right here with right. your phone yeah you know which 10 years ago no te- that. technology <laughs> I mean, technology is crazy and and you know even uh like build us his uh show on facebook live mm. um, you know so there's like an audience i think for you know whatever venue you have sure and speaking of audience i mean it just has picked up people that have known forever finally realize i have a radio show because they saw it on my facebook thing. right mm. right so it makes a difference it, 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 anything you can do to expand <laughs> your audience sure. is, is good What's one way that y'all, um, like, I know you do interviews and stuff like that, uh, but what's one way that y'all do, because you have a lot of connections in the in the uh, law enforcement and, and uh, military communities, mm-hmm. what's one way that, you know, you, you would encourage folks like that who want to do something creative, you know, how would you get them involved, you know, and say, hey, you know, this is what you can do? Because a lot of people, like you said earlier, they might not want to talk about stuff that they've experienced, you know, but then you might have somebody that's like, hey, let me... You know, how do you get them over that hump? Well, I, I think it's a lot easier for Bootsy and I because, <coughs> you know, a huge portion of our careers was was talking to people, right? Okay. I mean, you know, interviewing, right? You can't be a good cop. Oh, you can't yeah. be a good agent. That makes right? sense. If you don't have serious interviewing yeah. skills and you don't know how to relate to people. You know, so that, that kind of, we already have those abilities, you right. know, that we fine-tune throughout our career. So, so when it comes to the guests that we find, and, you know, we find these guests through our our network, you know, of of cops, of federal agents, of uh, you know, uh, <coughs> Navy SEAL guys, Delta, whatever it is, these special forces guys. We find these guests to these networks, and then talking, and you know, coincidentally, now most of these guys have these same skills we mm-hmm. have, so it makes our conversations flow because everyone's already on the same page. For the it's most. funny that you say that because I noticed like us talking today. I'm like, oh, it's a casual conversation style. I don't. I don't really like doing hard questions, you know. I just mm-hmm. like having like a conversation, and it seems like the last hour and a half or so has just kind of flowed, you yeah. know, with just talking back and forth about you know any kind of. I mean, we've talked about a lot of different little topics yeah. up and down. Well, you know, you just ask Bootsy if, if you know, you have to sit down and you and interview a murder suspect, right? Yeah, you better be able to flow. Right. right, you better be able uh-huh. to know how to no ask questions, air. know what to say, know what not to yeah. say, and how to well, do. It. And you got to know when to be quiet and let them go. Yep. You know, and if we, you know, Lou and I, the end of his career and most of my career, spent around him. Any successes that we had came because of the guys that we worked with, mm-hmm. and the, you know the dynamic personalities and that kind of stuff. But you could take. Lou in one operation, pick him up and then take a guy like Bird or, or Lowe's and, and drop them into that same situation. And they have that same dynamic. They, they same know they know how to fit and go. Yeah. With our interviews and stuff like that, that's it. You know, we start telling a joke, those guys finish it oh, because yeah. they already know where we're going. Yeah. You know, they, they have such similar experiences. Even a guy like Billy Smith. Yeah. Billy's been off the road forever, but he, you know, he a cop's a cop of a cop right. he picked up right where you know we were heading and we've had a lot of luck in that just our guests have been just as great as the guys that we worked with because a lot of our guests have been guys that we work with yeah. but i mean i think we could take anybody i like how you and, that was a, such a good segue 
Uh, it's pretty yeah. smooth. They're wasn't like it? our guys that we work with because they are the guys we work with. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, they're they're more willing, you know, to share these stories, right, uh, about their successes and their failures in, in these undercover operations overseas, and you know, in battle. Mm -hmm. They're they're more willing to share it with Bootsy and I because. They know we've been there and we've done that. And you, you've walked it. You've walked, right. you know, it's not you're like you're the just, same dirt, so to speak. You're not like a commentator. You're actually, you know, you've lived that life. Yeah. And that's what I was talking about earlier. Like, you know, I can understand it all day long, but to actually live it's different. You know, I, you can say that about any situation, anything that anybody's ever lived through. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that being authentic. And I'm not trying to, like, you know, use that word authentic as like a, you know, a term that's popular right now because a lot of people say, oh, you got to be genuine and authentic. But like literally, you do. <laughs> you do. That's like like bottom line. It's like if you're being insincere, people can tell. You know, they feel it. You know, you don't have to say, like, oh, you know, whatever. It's like you know the guy's full of whatever, you know, or or being genuine. So no, and, and I, I think like Lou was saying, you know, if you're sitting, you're interviewing a guy, if he thinks for a second that you are, you know, putting him on or, or trying to get over on him. There's no that shuts the whole thing down, and you there's no way you will succeed in that interview. It's a, it's the same stuff we're doing. If you yeah, know, if I think there's an agenda between what you're trying to it push, happened, as soon as you, know, you start pushing that, yeah. Then yeah, it's over. That's I feel the same way. And you I've lose had, your audience by doing that. Yeah, I've had the I've had the same thing. Um, actually, we were talking before we even went on the air today about a situation like that with the, with the other guy that we both know, and you know you know exactly. when somebody is trying to you know just to be associated with you just to be, you know, like, oh, I, I know so-and-so and the name drop and all that. and Or what's in it for them. Right, you know? right. So That's what I do with Michael Brooks at South Magazine all the time. I tell everybody I know. That's how I get invited to fancy uh, <laughs> parties and stuff. I, uh, you know, I met, talking about that guy, I met him because I was doing a spotted gallery for Savannah Morning News out at uh, Savannah State one day, probably about five years ago. And, um, yeah, he seemed like a really nice guy. Oh, man. Yeah, seemed like a super nice guy. He's done a lot for uh, Bootsy and I for our, you know, our, our careers post-law enforcement. Uh, he's he's a big supporter of law enforcement, big supporter mm -hmm. of the military. Uh, he has – he's given us some platforms we, we normally wouldn't have had. I mean, he put me on the cover of the magazine and did wow. a feature uh, on me and has helped me uh, with the book. He found my co-author and uh, – you know, he's helped Bootsy a lot. Bootsy's been in the magazine uh, just because he supports law enforcement. You know, he, he doesn't, there's no agenda, no agenda there. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, like I was saying earlier, I feel like, you know, it's important to show the good side of uh, what people are doing. You know, I mean, because you get so much, you hear so much negative, negative, negative. And I'm not, I mean, like, I'm a journalist. I write for the San Juan News as a freelancer. So I don't want to say it's the media. But that's the closest term you can say. You know, it's the media, which is obviously a generalization because it is. You, you have there's yeah. good and bad. We can't say all media is bad, and right? It's just like but you can't say all cops are bad or all police officers same, are same bad. Exactly. You know, you got to look at like, okay, what are the actual numbers? You know, is this a is this a, a anomaly? You know, is this just a you know like something bad that happened because of you know the wrong situation, wrong time, wrong whatever, right? So I think it's it is important to to show the good side of you know people, and I, I'm glad that y'all were you know talking about how with your show, you try to show you try to highlight the good stuff, and you try to show like the bad stuff. Well, you can't you can't be honest about things yeah. unless everything's got good and bad. Yeah. If you only point if you jade it one way, it, <laughs> it doesn't work. Again, if your listeners go go to the podcast and watch the podcast with Kent Terry, mm -hmm. the brother of uh, Brian Terry, the slain Border Patrol officer, we really lay it out in that one. Oh man! I, but I, I'm gonna have most of that one after I leave. But what a, what a guy to stay! You know, his his brother was killed ten years ago. Wow! And and this guy kept the man, kept the fight. He up. gets he gets on and he keeps carrying that flag. I got. I tell you, we we've talked to like genuine heroes, mm -hmm. Eddie Gallagher, Jay yeah. Dobbins. You know, we've talked to genuine heroes. This guy, he doesn't do it with a gun or a badge. I mean, he's a heavy equipment operator, yep. but. Loyal to his brother, his mm -hmm. family, and just standing. You talk about standing up and doing what's right. Mm -hmm. You know the, the courage that that guy has. I mean, my hat's always going to yeah. be off to that yeah. guy. Another episode we featured Michael Kimmelman, another New York Times best-selling <laughs> author, mm. who was just a normal stock market guy. Mm. Got caught up after the crash. It was one deal he did where he made sixteen thousand dollars, and they decided that was 
insider trading. He was just kind of swept up in this group with some uh, some guys who were a lot more famous and well known than him. And uh, because it was a political thing, very political. Go he get did, that guy. He served 31 months in Lewisburg, mm. okay, federal penitentiary. That's where Gotti was. Wow. This guy with no criminal history. FBI kicks his door in. It's like not a crime and like a really bad. And it wasn't a cr- and it not a crime. Yeah, yeah, and, not and a so, crime. And you know he watched that one too. <laughs> you know we expose what's wrong with the yeah. uh, with the system as well. You're listening to WRUU LP Savannah Georgia 107.5 FM WRUU dot org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. <laughs> Bill always says that soul. And, and I w- I would be remiss. We were talking about Michael Brooks, but you know the audience here is primarily uh, Savannah. If you haven't picked up South Magazine. Do yourself a favor and pick it up because the, you know, it's a pictorial magazine and the pictures in this place, you know, uh, Paul Graham takes a lot of the pictures and there's so many pe- photographers that contribute to it. But mm-hmm. this is a beautiful city and the pictures that this, these guys take and the way Michael Brooks puts it together, you know, you're doing yourself a distur- disservice if you don't take a look at it. Yeah, that's cool. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left or so for the show. Um, what's something that maybe we haven't, or maybe I haven't asked you about that you want to, you know, throw out there or talk about what's next. Yeah. Well, you know, we at storefront productions, uh, you know, that's the label we do the podcast under and, and, you know, a couple of other things. The biggest thing we want to do is get Lou's book out storefront. And that's, I'm telling you what a piece of art that will be. I mean, I, I think once it's, finally done and out it will uh open up a lot of eyes uh i'm also working it's crazy to me again it's crazy to me that i wrote a book in the first place but uh i'm working now i'm illustrating a uh children's book series with the love of my life she's written uh a series of children's book based on her boston terrier Mm. that was parked down in here in savannah and uh you know it's basically geared at good lessons towards (coughs) kids okay Uh, you know, bullying, crossing the street. We'll get into colors and all of that kind of stuff. But it's based in Savannah, so oh, okay. you'll see recognizable places. You'll see the Fountain in Forsyth. You'll see the Cotton Exchange. Oh, cool. you, you'll walk through City Market and that kind of stuff. But uh, that's been a fun adventure, and hopefully that will be uh, up and running towards uh, the end of March. We'll have them out, but that's a lot of fun. And then I don't even know what Jason's doing, but Jason flies out to Hollywood and, and tries to, he rubs elbows with movie stars and stuff like that. And you get one movie out with Lionsgate and you think you're a big deal. I tell you. I saw, when I saw Lionsgate, I was like, Ooh, yeah. cause they, there's a lot of good movies that Lionsgate put out. I was like, Ooh, look at this. I, I still, I'm, I'm blown away yeah, at, the, at the quality of, uh, the way they put that film together. Right. You know, again, talking about those guys at Alien Works, they did a short film that was called Ripple in the Water, which I don't think they've released yet, but they shot it on the water. Mm. And that was my first experience with movies. I watched it, you know, everything's rocking and moving and doing all these stuff. And I'm like, wow, yeah. that's really difficult. And then it wasn't two months later, I sat down and I watched uh, Dead Water. And knowing what they had to do to get the shots to make that happen. Mm. I mean, it really is. It's it's a incredible, it's a very, it's an excellent piece of work. Uh, well, I, that, I'll i have to put the, give the credit on that to uh, Chris Helton, who produced and directed it. Um, a very good friend of mine. Um, we've worked on a lot of projects together. Talented we've on dude. A lot more. Yeah, he's very talented. Um, and, you know, when we first uh, came up with the idea, he, he came to me and said, do you have, do you have a, a screenplay for this budget range? And I said, no. He said, can you write something? I said, yeah, of course. Mm. Let's sit down and figure out what we're going to do. So we sat down That's at Starbucks. Cool. Yeah, we sat, sat down at Starbucks at, on Victory Drive, and he said, uh, I says, okay, so if we have this much money, we got to do limited cast, limited locations. And he said, let's put them on a boat. Mm. And I said, we'll put them on a boat. And you know what? If I have any advice to li- <laughs> give anybody, don't ever put them on a boat because it is, it is difficult to uh, – to carry out but yeah. it did turn out you know no, and, and very well and um and was a you know i wasn't down for the for the shoot or anything but i was on the phone with chris three or four nights a week because we had to make changes to the script because the, the boat we used was different than the one i had written it for we thought we were gonna have one boat we ended up having a different a much better boat but, yeah um 
but it was different. So like um, that boat was like a yacht or something like that, right? Yes, yeah, so it was a multi-million dollar yacht. Yeah, um, and uh, very very nice. Very nice yeah. to see it in person. So what are you writing now, Jason? Uh, well, a black sheep white cop working on storefront, working on uh, is storefront your book, Sal? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm more, I'm not working on the book. I'm helping with some some of the other screenplay media. or something. Yeah. Or? Um, you get you heard it here first, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> or, or well, you've heard it here first outside of Into Watch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got another film that's supposed to go into production in Ju- uh, June, um, potentially. Well, you know, th- just real quick, because I I know you you've done different interviews or whatever, but like, what's your micro cap on if somebody has a story idea and they want to, you know, write a screenplay and mm-hmm. then they want to pitch it to somebody? You know what's a what, what like what's your thirty second take on on doing that on how to do it? Yeah, like what do you need to do? Like you know what what would you say is like the one thing? Like hey, you know. Well, I, if they're starting <laughs> from scratch, they should just read other screenplays. You can go online and find just about any screenplay that's ever yeah. been written now. So I would say start there, um, and then write it, and then rewrite it, and then rewrite it, and then rewrite it, and rewrite it until you uh, think that polish it. Yeah, think that, that it's to a level, and then have somebody that knows what they're doing read it because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you, that was a loaded question because you know I've, I've got this i wrote that book and i'm like man i'd love to turn that into yeah, a movie yeah yeah but well, then and then you know um and then don't have an ego about it because right. most of the time uh, artists are very very temperamental yes, right yes so they are they think that their stuff's like feelings, the best yeah, ever you know you can't get your feelings hurt you gotta <laughs> yeah. try to do what's right for the project and um and then find and then and find relationship build relationships with people that can help you get that to the next stage and just keep going yeah. until you get there. get with it get with a professional because that that's a funny thing like i was working with a guy his name's billy smith and he's like write your screenplay i'm like dude i don't know how to write a screenplay and i don't know how to write a screenplay but he told me the software and told you know he sent me a couple scripts i read them i followed the format and i i wrote what i thought was you know I did such a good job in my own head. I'm like, wow, this mm-hmm. is something else. And I showed it to some other folks, and they're like, yeah, you know, they weren't blown away with it like I was. Yeah. So I was like, huh. Well, then uh, when Jason and I met, I showed him, you know, my work, and I was expecting him to come back and be like, that's the greatest thing I've ever read, which he didn't say, and it still hurts my feelings. But when I gave it to him, mm-hmm. I want to say it was that night he gave me about 10 pages of notes. The same night, mm. saying, showing me this, this, and this, and I'm like, <laughs> and when I plugged in the notes, I was like, okay, makes sense. This guy, yeah. this guy knows what he's doing. That's and, awesome. I mean, but it was clear. That's awesome. The, the difference between a very amateur attempt and mm-hmm. a professional's state, that was what I saw, and I'm like, okay. Editing, I, I think editing as a job is one of the hardest jobs. It is. Um, we've got about a minute left. Sal, what's on the plate for you? So Jason uh, helped me co-write. A script uh, from my book, uh, basically a scripted television show, nice. and uh, it's and my my literary agent who's out on the uh, West Coast has it, and uh, he is in the process of pitching it. Uh, the book is in the process of, of coming together. Um, my co-author has uh, has a bestseller, New York Times bestseller, out right now, and he's he's trying to put together uh, the you know the pieces now to finish it off and, awesome uh, you know the podcast man the, the podcast is is an exciting thing uh, the the level the quality guests we're getting is it just keeps getting better and better and uh you know we want to we want to just keep this thing going and let it blow up uh we want to get beyond that law enforcement and military audience you know into everybody because mm-hmm. I think everyone can take something from it absolutely. absolutely oh yeah yeah I mean like that one question you know have I earned the right to judge? That's a huge takeaway for me today. Sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna be using that one. I'm gonna be telling people like, you know, Sal says <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> I'm gonna be like, Sal says you know you should put that on a shirt. Sal says <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, but, uh, you know, on a serious note, having having been on the street, you know, for this long, you know, yeah. for twenty six years, Bootsy's been on the street for a long time. Yeah. It, it gives you a different perspective. Uh and then to not only have been on the street and experienced a lot of successes, to experience some professional failures like we both have. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what made, that's what builds you. Right. Exactly. Right. And right. It gives you it gives you a little bit. You look inside yourself and you think different. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, thank you all for being on the show today. It's been wonderful. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so thank much. Um, what's that website real quick? Uh, you can find, uh, look for uh, Storefront Podcasts on uh, YouTube and also End of Watch on Apple Podcasts. Awesome. All Make right. sure you add the Bootsy and Sal. Yeah. Awesome. You should get the movie.